the Savior of the world. That's what we're introducing tonight, or that's who uh, we are introducing tonight. Introducing the Savior to the world. I have not preached expositorily since uh, I have been here uh, full time. Uh, When I was at Broadway Street, I preached a lot of expository sermons. I love preaching expository sermons. Uh, We exegete the Scripture. We take what God wants us to take from that Scripture, and we apply it to our life. We're going to go through the entire book of John expositorily. Uh, We're going tonight to look specifically at verses 1 through 5 of John chapter 1. But what we're going to do is sometimes we're going to go through about 10 verses. Maybe sometimes we'll go through a chapter. You know we got to stop at the I am statements when we find the seven I am statements that Jesus made through the book of John. We're going to have to stop there and study those. Many things in the book of John. Brothers and sisters, I think that we have a misconception sometimes of how to approach someone in a Bible study. Sometimes we approach them and we tell them about the church first and salvation, but we don't tell them about the one who purchased the church. We need to tell people about Jesus. We need to tell people about who He was, who He still is, what He offers to the world, how good of a man, not only God, but He was fully man as well, but how good of a man He was when He dwelt among us over 2,000 years ago, John chapter 1. In 14, he was here. He dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory full of grace and truth, as the Apostle John mentions in John chapter 1 in verse 14. The book of John, the gospel account of John was written so that you and I will believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing in him, we can have everlasting life through his name. And then the same apostle in the book of 1 John, he wrote it so that we can act upon what we believe. And so John was an eyewitness of the Savior. Can you imagine being an eyewitness, walking, handling the Word, the Logos, that is the Word, Jesus in the flesh when He came to this world over 2,000 years ago. You know, some books of the Bible, they list in the book a specific purpose on why the book was written. And that's what I love about the book of John. The book of John gives us the specific purpose on why the book was written. If you look over at John, we're doing an overview tonight, by the way, of John, before we get into these verses uh, by way of introduction. But if you look in John 20, uh, verses 30 through 31, notice what John says. He says, "...in many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples..." which are not written in this book. But these, what are these? Those things that are written. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life through His name. True or false? We teach the doctrine before we teach the person, you see. But we also live in a world that wants Jesus, but what do they not want? Oh, they don't want the doctrine. Give me Jesus, but don't give me the doctrine. But you see, Jesus minus doctrine, you have no Jesus. But you have Jesus plus the doctrine. What you have is the Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ that we read about in the New Testament. And that's who you and I need to get close to and understand and come to know. The book of John is going to help us have an intimate, personal relationship with the Savior of the world. Falling in love with Jesus yet again. I remember in 2013, I think it was in March at the Memphis School of Preaching, I was listening uh, to my good mentor in the faith, Brother Keith Mosier, teaching the book of Romans. And we was in Romans chapter 6, and I raised my hand and said, I need to be baptized into Christ. I've already been baptized before, but my conscience is just bothering me. I didn't have any assurance I had no confidence in myself, and I wanted to be baptized. So I went to the water, and I was baptized. And I remember coming out of that water, I was excited. I was ready to go. I have fallen in love with Jesus. But as the years go by, sometimes, every once in a while, I lose sight of the one with whom I fell in love. Well, that's what we're doing. We're getting back to that, falling in love with Jesus again. The Savior of the world, the Messiah. I want to know who He is, what He's about. I want to know uh, what He has done for man. I want to know what He said when He he was here on the earth. 
These things that are written in the book are going to cause us to do just that. The Gospel of John was written to produce faith, trust, conviction in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But it's also written to share the life that comes through that faith. We share it. You know, those that believed in Jesus, really, you think about the woman at the Samaritan well, when she heard about Jesus, she kept it to herself, didn't she? No, no, she didn't. She wanted to go tell people about it because she was introduced to the Savior of the world. She had no choice knowing what she knew and the one that she met to go out and tell people about this man. So by you and I studying the book of John and believing even more than we do now and having more of a conviction than we already do, we're going to share that life to others. God had a plan, did he not? He spoke to the patriarchs, that is, the heads of the households. Then he spoke through the prophets. Then he spoke to his apostles as they were given the Holy Spirit by Jesus himself, the Comforter. And now they, we have the apostles' messages throughout the New Testament, their testimony of Jesus Christ. Some of these were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. But John, the writer of this book, was an eyewitness of that man. I want to listen to him, don't you? Well, not only do I want to listen to him because he was an eyewitness, but I want to listen to him because he was inspired of God. So we need to take heed. Take, uh, a, a, if you will, a parallel passage. It's a must read. We have to do it. In 1 John chapter 1, the same apostle writing something here that he didn't clarify in the book of John. So we got to know this. We got to understand this. And I hope you'll read ahead and so forth as we study this book. But look at 1 John chapter 1. This is the apostle writing in 1 John chapter 1, beginning of verse 1, talking about the Word, Jesus. He said, That which was from the beginning, that's Christ, which we have heard, literally the apostles did, including John, which we have seen with our eyes, he's talking about the apostles, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the Word of life. For the Word, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that we which have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. That apostle also wrote the book of John that we're studying uh, this very evening and through the upcoming evenings that the Lord allows us to have. Isn't that wonderful? To listen to a man who is an eyewitness. To listen to a man who sat there for three years and heard this man next to him teaching and doing the miracles that he'd done. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. So John begins his gospel. John begins his gospel with an introduction in John chapter 1. And he begins this introduction telling us that the Word... Go over to John chapter 1. We go, we go over there. And he tells us that the Word was with God, but not only was the Word with God, but He was God. Is that not even a, a even, even more of a reason why you and I want to study this? Because not only was He with God, but He was God. Listen, either Jesus was a lunatic, or He is who He said He was, you see. Who makes claims like that? Who says that I am God? Well, Jesus did, because He was. If you make a claim like that, you better prove it. Jesus did. That's why we need to understand what He's writing. So John tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Savior of the world. Jesus existed in the beginning. He existed long before being born of Mary. Some say, you know, He came on the scene when He was born in Bethlehem of the Virgin Mary. No. He was there before the foundation of the world. He, along with the other two members of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, they were all there. In Genesis 1.26, God said, let us. Okay, let us. The word representing the three in the Godhead. Jesus' work in the beginning has great significance for us. Why do I study this book? I had to ask myself this in this study. What makes me want to turn to the book of John? I've, only, I've read it many times. I've studied it many times. But what makes me constantly want to go through it? Well, first of all, when I start 
losing my conviction, when I start losing my enthusiasm, when I start uh, becoming, uh, having an unbelief, when I start losing trust, I want to turn to the book of John. And I want, to th- I want to think and meditate and read about my Savior. I want to think and meditate upon the one who died for me. I want to know what he did. I want to know what he said. And I want to know what he still does even to this day. And I also want to come closer to him. When I fail to tell people about him, when I'm in a, when I'm in a if I'm sitting at the dentist office and there's someone here and, and I know that they're lost and they want to hear about Jesus and I lose sight of telling this person about him, I want to go look at the book of John and get me excited to tell that person the next time I see him or someone else that needs the gospel, if the Lord allows me that time, you see. So yes, it is important, and we ought not to take it lightly. I want to look at evidence, some evidences of Christ always existing. That is an amazing thing to me. You know, Christ has always been there. He's always existed. He's not a created being, as the Jehovah's Witnesses want to say. But he has always been there. He is God in the flesh, the creator of the world. How can we prove this? Well, we look at 600 years, or not 600, but hundreds of years. We're not talking about Isaiah tonight, but hundreds of years before Christ ever came into the world, he was foretold, prophesied by the prophets. Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Micah prophesied of the pre-existence of Christ. Micah said that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. Was he born in Bethlehem? He was born in Bethlehem. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church, he wrote the Book of Mormon, said that he was born in Jerusalem. Well, that's not right. Micah foretold of it years before Joseph Smith ever came along, hundreds of years, before thousands of years before Joseph Smith ever came along, he said he was going to be born in Bethlehem. And he was. The prophet Isaiah spoke of the king to come as an everlasting father. He, so, he told the nation of Israel, when he comes, he's going to be an everlasting father to you. Zechariah, in, that was Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, by the way. It's on the outline, and I'm going to try to follow it tonight the best I can. In Zechariah chapter 2, 10 through 11, Zechariah recorded the Messiah's own promise to come. So these prophets, hundreds of years before Christ ever existed, that is, in the flesh, came to this earth, spoke of him. It gives even more of a reason for me to study him, to study that man. Also, don't miss this. Today they tell us that we need to go to the land of Israel and God's going to come back and restore physical Israel. You've heard of it. We have the premillennial doctrine. You and I need to know something. When Jesus came into the world, the Jews missed it. The Jews missed it. They were looking for an earthly king to establish an earthly kingdom and to fight an earthly war. But they missed it. They didn't understand that Jesus was going to build a spiritual kingdom and He was going to reign over His spiritual kingdom, that He was the Messiah to take away the sins of the world. He wasn't what they wanted. I better not miss Him in the book of John. I better know who He is, what He's about, or I'm going to be like those Jews. You see, as they even had the scrolls, they had uh, those scrolls. You remember in John chapter 5, 39, search the Scriptures For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The Old Testament testified of Jesus. Testified of Jesus coming into the world. But the Jews missed it. So, not only uh, looking at more evidences here of Christ always existing, Jesus affirmed, affirmed it himself. Like I said, these claims that Jesus made, they would be blasphemous if they were not real. You don't make these kind of claims. You don't run around telling people these things if it's not true. You you see what I'm saying? Jesus made these claims. And that's what makes him uh, even more uh, of wanting to worship him. He claimed in John chapter 8, 56... This is by way of introduction. Remember that. He claimed in John chapter 8, 56, 58 to have existed in Abraham's day. He he, He was contrasting there in John chapter 8, the faith of Abraham and the faith of the Jews. And Jesus contrasted that faith and said, even Abraham did not know, but yet he believed. He knew the Messiah was going to come through him. He knew that God was going to preserve that seed through Abraham, but the Jews didn't. He claimed to have existed before Abraham's day. 
Look at John chapter 17, the prayer of Gethsemane. At, our, at the preacher's luncheon just a couple <clears throat> last week, the question for the luncheon was, when did Jesus weep? We, we would all say over Lazarus' tomb, right? John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept, one of the, the shortest verses in the Bible. It is not said that Jesus wept in the garden of Gethsemane, but it has to be implied. You know the man cried, but we don't have uh, uh, ways to bind that. But by studying, you know he cried. But look at John chapter 17, verse 4. Notice what he says. I have glorified thee on the earth. He praying to the Father, talking about him. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and now, O Father... Glorify thou me with thine own self. Notice, notice, with the glory which I had with thee. When? Before the world was. Amen. It's always been there. He was there with the Father. Well, Jesus, what did you give up to come to this earth? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 8 9. He became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. He gave up heaven to come here and to be mocked and scourged so that you and I can have everlasting life. Who do we serve? That's the man that we serve. Should I fall in love with him? Yes. And by falling in love with him, I can go tell somebody about it. You try to slow these apostles down. You try to slow them down. This man, John, that wrote the book, he handled the word. He listened to him. He's seen him with his own eyes. You don't slow these men down, even to the point of death. They said, we can't speak the, the things that we've seen and heard. You don't tell them to stop talking about Jesus because they had full faith, full confidence. Even in Revelation 22, 13, he affirmed that he always ex existed in his revelation to John. Also, it was affirmed by his apostles. You know, the apostle John, we're talking about his pre-existence. The apostle John in his gospel account affirmed the fact that Jesus had always existed. We already read that there in John chapter 1, 1 through 4. The same was in the beginning. The apostle Paul affirmed this fact as well in his writings to the church at Corinth. Look, oh, well, we don't need to, you don't have to, but if you want to, uh, we don't have time necessarily. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 4, that rock that followed them through the wilderness, who was it? That was Christ. Uh, what's, how does the song go? Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. The rock of ages, that was Christ. That's the one that led them through the wilderness. And that's the idea of Paul affirming the pre-existence of Christ. It was always there. Look at this claim in Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17. I'm trying to give you a reason tonight to want to listen to this man speak. Not me, I'm talking about Jesus. And even he speaks not just the red letters, we know. First, or Colossians chapter 1. If I would stop talking as I'm trying to turn there, I wouldn't lose my place. Colossians 1, and I want to look at verse 16. Looky here. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Well, Brock, give us another reason why we want to listen to this man through the book of John, why we want to fall in love with this man. All judgment has been given to him. I'm going to stand before him. He's going to judge me by his words. I need to make sure I'm listening to what he says because those words are going to judge me. John 12 and verse 48, Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. So the apostle Paul affirmed it. It is, un it is undeniable in the creation that all things were created by Jesus. Okay, He's the heir, appointed heir of all things. And judgment has been given to him. Let's look at our next Point, what is the significance of the Christ always existing? We know He's always existed, correct? Do we understand that? Do we know it? Yes. Since we know that He's always existed, what significance is that for me? Well, first of all, Christ is deity. When I say deity, He's part of divine, the divine nature of the other two of the Godhead, especially when we consider His nature. Micah 5, 2 we mentioned his going forth was from everlasting. Do you remember he made the statement in John 8, 58? Jesus said, I am. Do you know who else made that statement? Jehovah God. Do you remember at the burning bush, he told Moses, I am who I am. 
I am who I am. That's who Jesus is. He's the great I am. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning and the end. That's why we worship Him. He's the Messiah, Savior, Lord, Christ. He is the only begotten of the Father. Again, I want to look at the introduction of John's gospel account in John 1, 1 through 2. You'll find that he was with God, implying a personal communion with God. He was God, explicitly stating his deity. Thus, the Christ is worthy of our love and adoration. True or false? Does Christ deserve our love? True or false? Does Christ deserve our adoration and praise? You know, if I fall in love with this man, I'm never, notice, I'll never ask again, do I have to come back? Ever. That will never approach my mind if I fall in love with a man. I'll never say, do I have to study? I'll never say, do I have to do that? Do I have to go tell him about Jesus? Do I have to go door knocking? Do I have to do this and that for the church? Those questions will be eliminated when I fall in love with the Savior. When I'm introduced to the Savior of the world, you can't know these things and not do something about it, right? That's the idea. I can't know this, what I know, as this is inspired of God and not do something about it. Now, if I was talking to an individual tonight who didn't even believe in the Word of God, then this would be useless. But I'm talking to people tonight who believe in the inspiration of the Scripture. They know that this is from God. And the inspired Scripture says that Jesus Christ is the great I Am. He's the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, and all judgment has been given unto him. That's serious, and I ought to take it serious. So the Christ is worthy of our love and adoration. Also, because Christ is life. Christ is life. What does that mean? Well, by virtue of being the creator and the sustainer of life, he is life, right? He's not just a life, a good life, an alternative life, but he is life. I remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 3, 4. Christ is our life. Listen up. He's not content with being number one in your life. He's not. He is only content with being your life. You ought to make Him your life. He ought to be your everything. And so we need to understand that because all things were made by Him. All things were held together by Him. And John makes that clear in his introduction. Understand this. What we're talking about this pre, the pre-existence of Christ and the significance of Christ always existing. That's the vocal point of John 1, 1 through 5 in the introduction of the book. The vocal point is Christ has always been there. He is God. He opens the book up like that so everything else can be easily accepted. That's how I see it as I study the book of John. So, Without Christ, we know nothing was made. Thus, in Him was life itself. How do you think Paul, when he was in prison, could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? How can he make that statement? He knew who he was. You remember when Paul was introduced uh, to the Savior, right? You remember when he was introduced to the Savior? As soon as he was arise, he, he was baptized, immediately he went to go teach. Why? You can't keep that. You can't shut him up. He's got to tell somebody about the one that he was introduced to uh, uh, days before. You remember he said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The apostle made the statement in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. So Christ is also life. He's life, He's deity, and He's light. Well, why is that important? Because we live in a world of darkness, right? Look, go over to John 1 again. I got this Bible rebound, and it shuts. It used to stay open, and so I have to find my place again. John chapter 1. Look again, if you will, at the statement made in verse 4. Notice the statement. (coughs) In Him was life. And the life was the, not a, the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, but what? And the darkness comprehended it not. He came, he lived, he bled, he died, he rose, but they didn't accept him. The darkness of the world, when he came into the world, the selfishness of men denied the Christ. 
but He was light. You know, in Romans 10, 1 and 3, Paul's prayer for Israel is that they be saved. He said they were ignorant of God's righteousness and they were going about to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, Romans 10, 1 and 3. They were looking for something that was never in the mind of God. Listen, brothers and sisters and friends, that which was in the mind of God was this man. And what also was in his mind was to build his church so that you and I can be members of it. When I become a member of the body of Christ, I become one of his children. And now I can cry, Abba, Father. I have a purpose in life. I have a reason in life. I am something in Christ. I'm strong in His power and in His might. Galatians 6.10. Okay? That's confidence, and we've got to understand that. We all have that. I'm not just, and I'm saying me as, as in general, as all of us. But He was the creator, and He was the sustainer of life. Jesus, in the book of John, is uniquely qualified. You understand that? Uniquely, uniquely qualified to bring light into the world. What if I came to you, Carolyn, and I said, I'm going to bring light into the world? That wouldn't make any sense. What have I done? I haven't done anything. I haven't done these things that this man is saying. But he was uniquely qualified to bring light into the world because of who he was, who he is, his nature, what he could do, what he could say. Those Jews... They were always embarrassed when they were around him because they couldn't answer the man. Because Jesus was God. He knew their thoughts. Oh, man. We got to worship this man. We got to please this man. We ought to want to be a part of his family. Jesus calls for us to believe that we might become sons of light. Thus, Jesus offers us the light of life. When you follow Jesus, you have light. When you're happy as a Christian, it's because you know the Savior of the world. You've been introduced <clears throat> to the Savior of the world. As the psalmist said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my path. Let me ask you this question in conclusion tonight. Are we going to resist the life and the light that Jesus offers? Are we going to resist this man? Do we know of anyone else that has been better or that is better today no, because there has not been and there never will be. Some try to destroy him, but they fail to succeed. John 1, 5. Many have tried to avoid him, knowing that if they, if they avoid him, they don't have to change. John chapter 3, we understand 19 through 20, they avoided him so their deeds wouldn't be reproved. If you're willing to come to Jesus, if you're willing to come to Jesus tonight, he offers you hope. He offers you guidance in life. But you ought to understand something. And the onset of this lesson, and as the many lessons that we study in the book of John, we got to get excited. We got to get convicted, more convicted than we already are, to go out and serve Him and tell others about Him. He is capable of fulfilling His promises. You remember the statement He made in Matthew 11, beginning of verse 28, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and you'll learn of me, <clears throat> for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take up what he gives you. He's capable of helping you. Maybe you're here tonight and you never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, listen, I've just given you a reason to do it. I've introduced you to the Savior of the world. Not because of my wisdom, because what the book says. The book's right. And you can obey the gospel tonight through faith in that man, through that is trust, that's conviction, that's belief. Through repentance, making a change of life. Confessing that you believe that He is the Son of the living God. He is deity before witnesses. And then being immersed in baptism. Having His blood to take your sins away. He'll add you to His church. We're not going to ask you to join a church, but He's going to add you to His church. Even if we here at Nettleton were to kick you out, you're still a member of the church. You're added to His church. And that's the great thing tonight, which we wouldn't do that here at Nettleton. Just giving, just giving you an alternative of what some people could do, unfortunately. But if you're here tonight and you're a member of the body of Christ and you've fallen away, and you need to come home tonight, and you need to be reintroduced to the Savior, recommit your life tonight. Make it right.